Over the years, I've had the opportunity to work for multiple companies in San Diego and Los Angeles. I've worked as a user experience designer for American Addiction Centers, which is a company that helps people with uh, substance abuse. The other company I've worked for is Internet Brands. And over the years, I've, um, I've had the opportunity to understand what design is and how it positions itself to progress. Um, I've had the opportunity to look at um, where design is headed in terms of technology. And I've worked with multiple design teams in Ukraine, Macedonia, and New Jersey. And what we've done in terms of design is creating digital products, understanding what users do, understanding how the advancements in technology could better position design. And today, I want to take you on this journey of introducing design to you from my point of view. And I want you guys to see design from my lens. And the idea I want to talk about today is abstract. It's this idea that design is conscious. It's alive. It's using us to progress. And it's using us to shape itself and the future. When we look at these two objects here, you might see an ax or a bow and arrow, and you might see an older version or a newer version of what that looks like. Um, the group on the left here is an older example of how we solve problems in the past. Um, early civilizations took an object like this to either break down wood or to use it as a form of offense or self-defense. And the objects on the right are newer versions of that, newer versions that were basically pushed by markets or by uh, consumers. And what's funny is that what we used to use as a form of solving big stressors like hunger or safety, we might now use as a form of leisure. We might throw axes and have a beer, or we might do uh, archery and relieve stress. <laughs> So it's interesting to see how things have changed over the course of our human experience. One thing that stood out to me throughout my career and my life was my trip to Yucatan, Mexico. And I got to see the city of Chichen Itza. And I took an archeological tour there and I got to understand what the Mayans did and how they used design to anchor to different forms of knowledge like physics and uh, astronomy. And when I was there, I was really blown away by how methodical things looked. The spacing between blocks or the patterns that they established. But not only that, the placement of these structures was so impactful because not only did they design something elegant or pleasant, what they did was they created intention and they incorporated design into that intention and we're able to create very significant moments throughout a year. And I'll walk you through what I discovered. This here is the equinox, or known as the descendant of the serpent. And this building here, which is called El Castillo, which is one of the more popular pyramids in Chichen Itza, the shadow there produces a snake-like uh, figure, and that shadow meets the ends uh, or the bottom end of the northwest side to the head of the snake. And what this is, is basically a time in the year, and it happens twice a year, for two hours, where when the sun is setting, it forms this shape on the building or the structure. I created this visual to show you what it took to understand this. The minds were very um, knowledgeable in astronomy, and they understood their place in the stars. And this visual here shows that when the sun rays is perfectly leveled to the Earth's equator, which is a, um, it's perpendicular to the Earth's rotation, this causes the light to hit the building in such a way where it produces that shadow. And um, to the Mayans, this was a form of understanding what time of year it was, and also, um, 
a form of preparation for celebration. For me, this was so impactful, this visit, that I wanted to make my design portfolio Mayan-themed. And I created my own icons and my own um, animation. If you go to my website, um, and I'm not trying to pull a plug here, samnavars.com, um, if you go there, you'll see the different characteristics I added to my portfolio, which I designed and coded myself. And what I did here is I took the, a picture of, uh, this is an actual photo that I took of the Mayan pyramid, and I created this uh, light coming out of it, and you can see it animate. And to me, this was a representation of what I got to experience, and I wanted to make it personable for me. So I want to talk to you about how we might miss or dismiss design. Um, in this photo here, you can see a lot going on, the photo on the left side or the illustration on the left side. You might dismiss the tires that you use on a daily basis. You might dismiss that the tires were significantly designed so that uh, water could run off through the grooves. And when you're driving, you're not maybe thinking about, oh, I wonder how my tires are doing in the rain, or I wonder how this is protecting me in the rain. The turns are usually designed by a civil engineer or transportation authority. And these turns are calculated in such a way to figure out what the angle should be for the distribution or weight distribution of a vehicle when it's passing through the turn, um, the height of the vehicle, and that's why you see suggested speed 35 miles per hour. I know some of us don't really um, abide by those. <laughs> the part on the right side is the runoff water. Where is that water going? It's important that when it rains, water is being distributed or dispersed outward from roads so that cars can travel safely. When water starts to stack up, um, it's usually because it wasn't designed by a hydrologist. And when we look at design, we know that civil engineering is a form of design which has anchored itself to physics and to hydrology. So all these professions that we know of have some form of design methods or constraints. But we're starting to see that design is forcing people to anchor the bodies of knowledge that they know and expertise to bigger and more sophisticated forms of thinking. And then this feedback loop is causing us to progress. It's pushing us to become safer. It's pushing us to become more aware of the gaps that are needed to fill in. Here are three examples of how design can uh, mirror the organic world or the natural world that we live in and that we observe on a daily basis. So what you see here is a representation on the top, the first section on the top, you see a representation of the uh, breakdown of a brain and the neuroscience behind a brain. Below that is a representation of our roads at night and where cars are traveling from left to, or from A to B. And this here is a representation of a network that is in constant communication. We're always connected. Uh, there used to be a time where we were able to go offline. Now we're always online. So it's very interesting how, as time goes on, everything we're building is slowly mirroring the natural world. In the middle, in the middle here, you have bees, uh, which are a protective insect species. They have stingers, and their whole objective is to protect their hive with the uh, golden honey that they uh, work so hard to collect. Below that is a citadel or a castle, which also mirrors the same thing. Um, there are soldiers in, at one time there, was, there were soldiers who protected their communities and the good things within those communities. And on the right is a photo of ants traveling through a branch, getting from A to B, going back and forth, and we, in some ways, do the same thing. When I worked at American Addiction Centers, I was tasked to perform a user experience audit. And what that means is having um, the tools necessary to create a full breakdown or report of a website. 
this report really taught me to understand design from a different lens. Originally, I was trained to create something aesthetically pleasing, design websites that served the user, and that looked good and communicated the proper information for a business. But when I performed this user experience audit on one of our websites at American Addiction Centers, I was able to see data that I've never really thought about. I was able to see what frustrated users, how much time they spent on a page. I was able to see thousands and thousands of sessions where they proved which funnels were actually working and profitable for the company. And I was able to see the gaps in opportunity from a business standpoint. And that's where I learned what data-informed design is or was. And now I've been exposed to a different form of design. And user experience design is continuously evolving and pushing for designers to become more data-informed or more um, technologically aware of what they can build. A book that caught my attention earlier this year is Laws of UX, Using Psychology to Design Better Products and Services by John Jablonski. And in this book, there are multiple laws that are very tied to human behavior. Um, things like what is cognitive load or how many items can a person obtain in one sitting from a memory standpoint. So the two laws that I want to focus on is Hicks Law and Miller's Law. Hicks Law, the time it takes to make a decision increases with the number of complexity of choices. And Miller's Law, the average person can only keep seven plus or minus two items in their working memory. Now, I don't know when the last time you were on Craigslist, but it hasn't changed much. It has a very classical, archaic, overwhelming look. There are so many options still on that website. It looks much cleaner than it was before, but when you go on that website, you're bombarded by so many options. And the time it takes to figure out how to navigate that site is a little bit more than what you might see today compared to websites like OfferUp, where most of the suggestions that are given to you are already derived from previous sessions or different cookies from other websites that you've searched. So the experience is much more direct, and it's a lot more minimal. And the OfferUp, OfferUp experience is a little bit more user friendly. And OfferUp probably uses these two laws into uh, heavy consideration compared to Craigslist. So this feedback loop here is how I want you guys to see design. Because this is how I see it. I see design as we think about things, and then we create. We create infrastructure. We create forms to utilize water safely. We create forms to obtain power and energy. And then that affects our households, what we do on a daily basis, how we go to work, and what we drive. And we can see the progression of technology impacting all of these things, and then letting us know, the progress lets us know where the gaps are. So it's, we're constantly in this feedback loop of design dictating where we should go and what we should achieve. So this is kind of a visual of what has been completed and where, where we're headed, or what the empty blocks look like. So the solid squares there are, are the achievements we've completed, and the squares with the strokes are what's currently worked on. And the dashed borders represent all of the gaps of opportunity that we're going to start seeing in the future. But this adds something else to the mix now, with artificial intelligence being such a prominent aspect to our daily lives and to an introduction of how we can view work. If you go on LinkedIn now, for those of you who have link LinkedIn, you'll see a lot of articles posted about artificial intelligence disrupting the way we think, the way we do things now, from writing emails to programming to how we might set up an outline for school. It's impacting and embedding itself into so many things. And the more we input, the more it's learning what it is that we're trying to achieve. So this is 
now a shift in how we're thinking because before we would have to come up with much more in terms of creating constraints for the projects that we're trying to come up with. Now we have an ability to communicate and embed AI into our workflow and ask it questions and give us a level of guidance so that it could kind of streamline things for us, which is impacting our behavior. We're going to start looking at work differently now. So from a design standpoint, now we're introducing a new form of thinking into the existing loop. And design is going to call for more artificial intelligence features into the existing feedback loop that we currently experience in our human, human experience. So as we input more information into AI, we're going to have a better understanding of how much water we're using at home, uh, when the sprinklers should be automated. On the, I know those things are now, they have a form of automation, but we're going to be a lot more connected with those things through our phone because more bridges are going to be gapped and closed. And we know that artificial intelligence is already doing a good job of being used in the appliances we use at home. Um, I was talking to a friend about how many times I turn off my light, and it's been many uh, days since I've had to actually go up and turn, on, turn it off because my room is now a smart room and when I leave my house, everything turns off because it knows where I am with um, geotargeting or GPS. So I asked AI this interesting question because I was on this trail of understanding what the Equinox is and the equinox is basically the day where the hours of day and night are perfectly equal, so 12 hours each. And I had this thought that came into my head, and I wanted to ask AI to give me a breakdown. I asked, what are the percentages between hours of night versus day for each month in the year in Southern California? And it gave me an approximation of the percentages between night and day from January all the way to December. And then I thought, wow, this would be really good information for anyone planning a festival that's traveling through Southern California where they might want to you know, have their festival take place at night and they want to be able to utilize most of the light before the sun sets. So this is a tool that anyone could use now. And actually, a few days ago, uh, ChatGPT, which is part of OpenAI, released their iOS app. So now everyone has an opportunity to interact with artificial intelligence. I want to leave you guys with this. I want you guys to understand that design has been with us, this method of constraints, this method that teaches us how to get from A to B when it comes to solving a problem. Design is something that calls for self-critique. If you know any creator of music or art, there's always a question leading up to what is created. Design is comprehensive and clear. It calls for logic. And it, it's governed by regression and progression. And it's paving the way we think. It's paving the way we build. It's here to stay. And it's going to use us to get to the future. Thank you.